Hi, so before we get started, I'd just like to ask you, if you're new here, please consider subscribing to the channel and also at the end of the video, please consider give it a thumbs up if you found it useful. Also leave a comment below on ways to and suggestions and ways to improve this video moving forward. Let's go. In this lesson, we are going to cover rules in JUnit 4. So what are rules? Rules are a mechanism that essentially allows you to extend the behavior of a JUnit test by, you know, by leveraging this rules mechanism. Um, essentially, rules, um, any, everything that rules provide, you could do it, you know, manually, um, you know, either by a util class or maybe by putting behavior on a base class that your, each of your, um, uh, test classes would extend but as you will see it's just a very convenient you know foolproof bug free way of encapsulating behavior um, that you compose um, you know your class your test classes with as opposed to be you know extending base classes so um, JUnit 4 as of now comes with these um, provided rules so basic rules are split into provided rules which is rules that you can just you know use as is and then custom rules custom rules is nothing but the JUnit uh, 4 mechanism that allows you to extend the behavior or implement your own rules or extend the behavior of an existing external resource rule for instance so the first, so we're going to cover each of these provided rules here. So the first rule, which is the expected exception rule, I have already covered in the um, exception lesson. Please refer to that lesson um, for details on the expected exception rule. Um, so let's cover the temporary folder uh, rule. So recall that um, from the um, exception lesson, when we use the expected exception rule, that rules are defined um, by, um, you know, using the rule annotation. And then you basically do public final temporary, and then you put the um, name of the rule. Okay, new temporary folder rule. Okay, so this is essentially how you declare a rule. Uh, you uh, tag it with the uh, rule annotation and you, you know, uh, define the, the rule as a field of your class. So, now, what does this rule do? So, as you can see from the name, this rule extends the behavior of your test by providing a mechanism to create temporary files or folders that are, as the name implies, after you're done with your test, they are automatically deleted and cleaned up. So, every time you have a test that needs to create some folders or some files, as you can imagine, you know, it's a pain for you to manually have to create those files and then, you know, release or delete those files. So the temporary folder rule enables you to do all of that automatically without you having to do all of that boilerplate code. So if you look at the uh, interface, you basically have a way to create, uh, have a few um, factory methods here. So you can basically create a file, a temporary file, or create a temporary folder. If you create a temporary file, you have two options. One is the the option without an argument creates a randomly named file in the JUnit temporary uh, folder, and this option that takes an argument obviously you know creates a file with that name. The folder uh, factories there are, there are three fa folder factories here. Uh, the new folder just creates uh, you know a randomly named folder this one creates a folder with that name and this allows you to via these um, var arg arguments to create deeply nested folders so for the sake of this example let's um, use the new file and let's just give some file name and let's assign this to um, you know a local variable here and uh, i suppose i could also create a new folder with the name uh, foo. So let me add a breakpoint here and debug this uh, test for you to see where each of the um, files are being created. So notice that the file has been data.txt is being created on this um, randomly generated uh, JUnit folder as well as the foo folder file. So one thing before moving on is that um, as of version 4.12 of JUnit, one limitation of the temporary folder 
uh, rule is that if for some reason you cannot delete the, fold the temporary folders of files, you are not notified about it. You don't get any error. So uh, starting at version um, 4.13, I think, they added the ability to do um, a strict verification of the of the ability to delete these temporary resources, files or folders, and if that fails, then you get uh, an assertion failure. So, and um, that's basically what you would do. So the, the usage is exactly the same, the type is the same, you just use the builder pattern to create the, um, the temporary folder rule. It's right here because I don't have the, the version I'm using is 4.12. So the next rule is the um, that we're going to cover. So we cover the temporary fold rule. Let's talk about the test name rule. Okay, so let's add our test method. So as you can imagine, the test name rule is a rule that enables you to um, get access inside the test to the name of the method and run a very simple assertion for you to see how to use this. So test method, assert test method, then uh, let's use the core matcher is core matcher uh, equal to um, name get method name. And as usual, let's just import this statically and here as well. Okay. And obviously, if I were to have another test method here, then if I were to run this, actually let's just run the whole thing, then it passes. Okay, so moving on, the next rule we're going to cover is the timeout rule. So the scenarios are when you know the test is executing a long operation, perhaps you know connecting to a database or loading some resource off of a socket connection or doing some lengthy operation, perhaps some, you know, crazy scientific computation. And you want to make sure that the test doesn't exceed a, a certain upper bound. And if it does, you basically want to fail the test. So just like before, you just do a public final timeout, give it the name, the type, and uh, let's just give a timeout name here. And they have this factor here called um, so there is actually, uh, you can specify the time in milliseconds or seconds. For the sake of this example, let's just specify in seconds. And let's say that I want the upper bound for all of my tests to be, say, two seconds. And now in your test methods, basically, this rule is going to apply to all the tests inside this test class. And every test that exceeds two seconds will basically fail with the timeout exception. So for example, let you know just run a small a simple test here and then let me sleep for um, half a second so test rules method lasted for and let's obviously add this exception and let's run this okay so this test passed because the it basically ran for 501 milliseconds which is less than two seconds so now let's add another test method so basically, this is a test that will never uh, finish, and uh, let's see what's going to happen here. Okay, so after two seconds, um, the test has failed with the timeout exception, because it lasts for more than two seconds. So now if I run the entire, um, uh, all the tests inside this test suite, notice that the test method passed because it lasts less than two seconds, whereas this test failed. Okay, so moving on, the next uh, rule that we are going to cover is the error corrector rule. The error corrector rule is used in scenarios where in your test uh, you are doing an operation that you know uh, creates a problem, generates an error, and you want to continue the execution. So you don't want to stop at the first error. You want to collect all of the errors and then at the end see what passed, what failed, and so on. So to demonstrate this, I've got here a very simple class, component under test, that basically throws an NPE, an array index out of bounds exception, and a method that doesn't. Let me just create the uh, component under test. Okay, so again, I mean, this is just a simple example. You would not instantiate this um, component under test inside the test method. With that caveat, let's uh, demonstrate the use. So under normal circumstances, if you just call under test throws NPE, then and obviously your test will fail, you will know about the error 
and that will be that, right? So that's a normal, um, you know, execution of uh, JUnit. But let's say that you don't want that. Let's say that you want to do a bunch of operations in this component of the test, and then at the end, be notified about all the errors. Essentially, you don't want to stop the execution at the first error. You want to continue till the end. So what you do is wrap this on a try catch, and here you'd use the collector rule to basically add the error. So we just add the exception. And here you can also check um, that the value, for example, let's say the message, you could assert the message is um, is core matters equal to the uh, null pointer exception. And um, and you do the same for the other method under test that throws the error index, index out of bounds exception. Okay, and obviously, you know, you could be doing other operations like under test, um, you know, foo. Okay, so let's run the test and see what happens. So notice a couple of things here. So firstly, um, the test fails because even though we are catch, I'm catching the um, NPE here, because I'm reporting an error on error collector rule, you know, the test will be considered to fail. So this error is, is going to be considered a test failure. It's going to be reported. It's not that the error co co collector just swallows the exception, you know, and lets your test pass. No, the test is, is failing because an NPE is thrown. We enable the test to continue to proceed execution even after the first failure. And we're collecting all of the errors here. So at the end, we report that the test failed but we have more information because we see all of the failures, not just the first. So if you look at the um, console here, you will see that the three methods were invoked. The first that throws the NPE, the foo that doesn't do anything, and the last one that throws an array index, index out of bounds exception. And then we have these two failures, two in exceptions here that were thrown. Okay, so let's move on and cover the external resource rule. And uh, this is slightly different uh, rule in that it doesn't really have uh, basic behavior. You have to implement it. So let's assume, for example, that I have here a server which has a connect and disconnect methods. Again, you know, just a very simple example to illustrate an application of the external resource rule. So then I have here my, my server. Uh, let me just instantiate here for the sake of this example. And here on the before method, I would connect. And on the after method, I would disconnect okay so so now let me implement the test method uh, one and let's just do this and test method two and do that so let's run this method and see what happens okay so um, I see server connect so this is um, why don't we split this thing here so when my the test method one is invoked so notice that the um, before uh, rule is a method is called first which connects to the server. And then the method, uh, the test method uh, runs. And then the disconnect uh, method, which is the before on the rule, it's invoked. And the same thing, the same B pattern of execution for the other method. I mean, obviously this is not exactly what we want because this is essentially the before and after, you know, annotation and methods uh, behavior, okay? We, what we want is for this to be called only once the server connect before every test and then the server disconnect to be called at the end after all tests have um, executed. Okay, so now let's see how we can improve this so that this rule is ran only once at the beginning and then after at the end to disconnect from the server. So this is where um, the uh, um, class rule come into play. So as you can, as you, as you see, all of these rules are applied to a me test methods. So what we want to do is we want to convert these from a test rule to a what's called a class rule. It's a very simple change. The only thing you need to do is change the annotation from rule to class rule. So the first thing we need to do after this change is to change the resource to static as well as the instance. So now with these uh, three changes, uh, let's run all of the tests here and look at the behavior. So now, as you can see, we have the exact behavior that we want. So server dot, which is the you know before class and the after class behavior. So server dot connect, 
is done um, it's invoked in the beginning before each test is invoked and then each test runs and then at the end we disconnect from the server cleaning up the resources so this is exactly the behavior that we wanted now obviously one thing we need to do is we don't want this to be inside the you know a test class because the whole point of this rule is to be reused across uh, different uh, tests so let's extract a um, class here okay so now that we have extracted our server rule basically uh, the only thing uh, that I've done is just extract that uh, anonymous inner class into a top level class which implement still extends the same um, external resource rule and here you know in your test method the way you would use it is we would use a, um, a class rule public static uh, final and um, we'd call server rule which is the resource and instantiate it okay and then here um, I can get my server and invoke some method foo here and here so now let's run this and see uh, if we still have the same behavior so as you can see we still have the same behaviors okay so before wrapping up this um, quick overview or introduction to JUnit 4 rules let me just cover the um, uh, very quickly uh, the rule chain and you basically compose or chain these rules say so you have an outer rule here and then you put you know around as many as you want and then uh, you know and then that's that so this um, is a way for you to chain or to essentially specify an order of the rules to be applied um, you know for each test method with regards to custom rules I've already shown you how to define a custom rule one of the ways so one way is to extend an external resource and implement the before after um, methods another thing that you can do is to basically um, implement a test rule interface so this wraps up the um, quick overview of JUnit 4 rules I hope you found this introduction to JUnit 4 rules useful thanks for watching